All right. So before we get started on today's lecture, does anybody have any questions about the midterm coming up? Does anybody have any questions about the midterm? Yes. Yes. Ah, oh, I'm sorry about that message. It's one and two. I apologize. Um, like I said, it, and here's the way to double check. If I type, if I do a typo like that or something, just remember that I have a policy where I do not test you over something that I haven't finished teaching. We haven't finished uh, the material for chapter for week three yet. We're still finishing it because, to be honest with you. This is the kind of stuff that people, physics professors usually gloss over. My physics professor didn't teach this material properly. They, they skipped it over because there was so much other material to cover. But it's very important. Like today is going to be an extremely, extremely important lecture that totally gets glossed over in most treatments of it. I mean, I'm not saying everybody's going to gloss it over, but for some reason, every time I took this class, they never covered this properly. So we're going to cover it in detail. You're not going to be tested over anything from this week. No Faraday's law, no induction, just straightforward magnetism, forces on currents and wires, um, and also magnetic fields generated. But don't, but don't, you know, don't think that that's not a lot. There's a lot of material there. Make sure, make sure that you know that material really well, because just because there's only two set two chapters doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be easy. There's a lot to know there. It's very um, detailed material. Um, but the questions are very fair. So there, if you study the material and you understand everything, you've done the homework, you're going to be in good, a good position. Okay, I see a lot of hands. I don't know who was up first. I'm just going to start um, from this side and work my way this way. Yes. 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 So there's going to be more than 10 if we include the multiple choice. There's going to be about 10 good problems, problems, maybe a little more, maybe a little somewhere. It, it depends on how, how the problems work out. I haven't completely made my final decision yet. I put a lot of time and th in effort into making this exam as fair as I can. So I, I don't make it in a hurry. I've been working on it for the last week or so, uh, making it, writing questions, making questions that are very interesting, very fair, well balanced, and I have to sort of time it. The timing is really tricky for the other class because it's only 50 minutes. This class, I have a little bit more leeway because we have an hour and 50 minutes, which is great. That's a good amount of time to take a good test. So we'll see, but there'll be like in that ballpark of about 10. You're going you're gonna to need most of your time to finish this exam. It's not going to be quick. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of problems on it. It's going to be testing a lot of aspects of your knowledge, um, a lot of stuff that we've gone over. There's a lot of material that we covered so and you'll see it. It's there's a good distribution of it on there. Okay, yes. Um derivations. You know, that's always a weird question. Because technically no, but kind of when you do a problem, you sort of you this material is challenging enough that there is cases where when you're solving a problem you have to sort of use a little bit of math to sort of derive your own formula for something. But I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. I don't, think, I don't think any of the stuff that I've put on there qualifies as anything close to a derivation to the level of this and that. Like I said, yes, this class is calculus-based, but you're not going to be expected to do like trigonometric integrals, things like that. If we come to a point where you have to take an integral, I'll just give it to you on the exam and tell you this is the integral. Because I don't, I don't want to test your... So what we're testing here is your ability to do physical reasoning to like basically apply coordinate systems and vector calculus and understand, primarily understand the science of it. Because this is, first and foremost, it is a mathematical science course, so there's a lot of mathematics in it. But I don't want the science to get lost in the math. That happened to too many times in the physics classes. They get, it turns into just a pure math show off contest or something and I don't like that. I want it to be more science based. So yeah, not too much not too much on the derivations. Just be real strong on the homework, be really strong on the formulas and what they mean and what they're how they're applied for certain situations. 
Are all the problems going to be extremely easy? No. Some of them are going to be very straightforward and easy if you've been paying attention and doing the homework. Some of them are going to be a little bit more challenging. There's a gradient of difficulty on this exam. That's just how courses are designed to be. You have to have a little bit of a more, just like driving, right? When you do the driving exam, some of it's easy, some of it's a little bit harder, and some of it's kind of challenging, like the parallel parking. If you're, if you're inexperienced, it might be challenging for some people. So things like that. Okay, so it's, it's going to be very fair, but there will be a few questions on there that might be difficult. And like I said, this is my first time writing an exam for this kind of course. I have written questions for exams for professors before, but actually doing, and quizzes, of course, but doing my own full exam, this is my first time, but what I want to see is I don't want half the class walking out here with an F thinking, am I going to pass this class or not? That's what I saw too often in the other cl the classes that I took as well. I want there to be a lot of clarity on what the grade is and you get you get out what you put in. You don't just study a bunch of stuff and then none of it's on the exam because I just picked problems that I didn't even talk about or topics that I didn't even talk about. That's another reason why we're not doing any of, chap of this chapter on this exam yet because I haven't finished teaching it. So why would I test you over it? Yes. It's going to be more challenging than the quiz. The quiz was, the quiz was definitely... Um, but, but not all of it is going to be more challenging than the quiz. The quiz is an example of your low-level difficulty question that you're going to see on, on this exam. But, um, but like I said, that's sort of subjective because maybe some people found the question. You kind of you knew it was going to be, you knew really where to look so it wasn't as challenging, but maybe if I had just covered that problem, glossed over it real quick, and put it on the exam and you hadn't seen it too much in the homework, maybe it would have been harder. I don't know. It's a, it's a very challenging thing to put a good exam together because I have to like make sure that you've had some experience with it, either not necessarily, oh, and not necessarily everything on the exam will have had a corresponding homework problem. Like it's not going to be like the quiz where it's purely based off of the homework, right? That was the sort of the rule going in. The quizzes are based purely off of the homework. Basically, I take a homework question, change the numbers around a little bit, might change change the scenario just a little bit, but it's the same carbon copy problem. Will there be some problems on this exam that are kind of like that? Yes. It won't be all completely new, but there will be a, some that you are, you're going to have to think about this stuff a little bit because it's going to be a little bit different. Sort of like on the spot, like, okay, let me think about this. Let me try to apply this. And then as far as partial credit goes, um, I'm not sure how I'm going to assign partial credit. It's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis for every question. So when I, when I go through the exam and I make my, my solutions to it, I will make the decision on how much partial credit I'm going to award at that time. And there's no hard and fast rule. However, the rubric that I apply to one person has to be applied to everybody. I have, a very, I have, I have to be very specific so I have to give my graders very clear instructions for that I'm actually going to have like meetings with them about this you know concerning this topic because it's very important that we make sure everybody gets their exams graded consistently um, so we should be good there too I'm putting a lot of time into that making sure that it works out as well okay more questions uh, yes more than 50 minutes this course it's going to take the full class time i'm not going to say it's going to take everybody the full class time but it will it will take it will take much more than 50 minutes for pretty much anybody to complete it because it's 10 it's going to be over 10 problems so i mean even if you take 10 minutes on a problem or something some sometimes you might take less some you might take more but you can see how it's going to be pretty easy and I'm not going to say 10 exactly. It might be a little more than that, actually. It depends on the... Some of the shorter ones are going to be... Hold on a second. And that's a good, that's a good thing. You want, you want somebody to give you a longer test with more questions on it. What you don't want is to do something stupid like they did at my university where they give you one test for the entire semester, or quarter actually, it was a quarter, 
that has two questions on it and then if you don't know how to do a part of one of those two questions because the question has like 10 different steps and to get to the next step you had to know how to do the step before it you just fail that question that's what you don't want right you want you want an exam because what an exam is is it's like a photograph of a, of your knowledge so what's going to be better a better photograph two pixels or like 15 right 15 pixels is going to be a better sampling of your knowledge base but which one takes more time to grade and is more effort to put together the 15 pixel exam it takes a lot more work it's kind of like it takes a lot more time to do like three office hours a day than it does to do like one office hour a week or something but it gets a better result for the exam it's like you you get it's like putting in a lot as in terms of the teaching aspect of it but that's that's the way it should be though in my opinion it should be a better sampling so even if it takes longer to grade yeah, oh by the way i want to get everything optimistically i want to get everything graded so people have their grades on this test by the end of next week um if i have to i'll start grading them too to get it done faster if it if it starts to take a while i'll i'll work with the graders and come up with a system i might have to like but we'll but we'll try to get it done anyway uh, i saw a question in the back yes no cheat sheets. The, the exam will have all the equations that you need on it. The reason that I don't allow cheat sheets is very simple. I know exactly what can be done to cheat. I know exactly how people could cheat. What you could do is you could write a bunch of equations on a sheet, and then you could have 10 other sheets in your pocket. And then when I'm not looking, you could take out one of those other sheets that has all the problems written on it and basically copy every single problem that we've ever done so that you basically have a solutions manual at your disposal. Like I exactly know why that that is. Just so you know, like people keep asking me, why don't you allow a cheat sheet? It's like, because I'm too smart. Like I figured that out. <laughs> like I, I, I don't just think like, I think I, like how, how if, I could, if I didn't know this material, how would I cheat? I would cheat like that. So because of that, I'm, I'm gonna put all the equations on the exam so there cannot be any pieces of paper that do not look like the exam, yes. No, that didn't work. So, okay, so those, those exams were open book. You could have as many notes and things as you wanted. They didn't even care, and p you still couldn't solve it. They would pick, pro sometimes he would pick problems from his research and put it on there. I'm not joking. <laughs> yes. Uh, the equation sheet. I don't have it completed yet, but once I get it completed, I definitely will post the equation sheets for future use. Of course, you're welcome to use the equation sheets when you're solving the problems. Probably what we'll do is we'll keep all the equations and you'll have like a master copy of all the equations. It's not gonna be one sheet, by the way. I mean, even for the other class, which has less, maybe it doesn't have less formulas in this class. Well, the other class on their midterm, it's got like three or four sheets. And they're, they're big print, they're very easy to read. Okay, and here's another thing about the exam. The exam is not gonna be stapled, it's gonna be paper clipped. That's because if, since I'm providing the equation sheet, it's annoying to have to flip through back to the page that has the equation sheet on it and go back to your problem. This way, since it's paper clipped, you can take the equation sheets out and just have them in front of you while you're working a given page. It's also much easier to scan it on the grade scan because then I don't have to rip out the pages from a stapled thing and make it the paper all like all over the place because then it's hard to get scanned through the machine, right? So every, every test is gonna be paper clipped. Also, there will be assigned seating. You can't, you're not gonna be sitting, you're probably not gonna be sitting by the person that you know if you know somebody in this class. You're gonna, there's gonna be assigned seating that day too. Because like, I understand that like, people can have codes and be like, Psst, you know, and then just like, so yeah, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna know who you're sitting by that day too. But there's more, there's more to it than that. That system also exists for another reason. Because by doing assigned seating, I'm gonna have exams, there's gonna be different versions of the exam, and I'm gonna put the exams down before class starts. That way, we don't lose any time handing out exams. Because can I hand out 200 exams by myself under a normal system after everybody sat down? No, I'm gonna need like, five people to come here and join me to help hand out exams, but I can't get that many people probably. I mean, maybe, but 
with this system, I'm going to have everything set up. You're going to come in. I'm going to assign you a seat. You're going to sit down, and you're going to have your test in front of you. You're not going to flip it over or look at it, but you're just going to get your calculator out. Um, I'll try to have extra calculators. We can't do calculator sharing on the midterm, so. but what we can do is I'll, I'm going to try to have like 10 extra calculators. And if you need to do a calculation or something, you can leave the equation like it is and then do the calculation, like go to the next problem and do the calculation later. But if you really need to check your result, you can just like get my attention and I'll come over and I'll help you. I'll, I'll make an arrangement with somebody or I'll, I'll try to have, I really need to have extra calculators because I can't be bothering somebody else that has a calculator and in interrupting their exam. Yeah, I'm pretty much going to have to have 10 extra calculators. And then and maybe if you don't have one though, I might have to like take it and give it to somebody else though. So try to just bring your own calculator, okay? Bring your, bring your scientific or your graphing calculator. Um, and then, let's see, there's something else. If you have special accommodations, like if you're a really tall person, somebody asked me, can I sit in the back because I'm tall? Yes. If, you need, if you're left-handed, just let me know ahead of time, and you can have a left-handed desk, and I'll let you pick it if you have that accommodation, right? There's going to be a few people that have special accommodations for seating. That's fine. Um, I'm probably definitely going to want all these seats up front occupied because we're gonna ha the class is going to be full. Everybody's going to be here ready to take it, so it's going to be quite crowded. So we want everybody like kind of make sure that we have as many like seats taken as possible. So when you come in, the assigned seating is going to work. Everything's going to be like filled, like from front to back. And then if there's extra space, there might be some seats in the back for people who are tall or something. And I'm going to be – I'm not going to be like – you know, doing something else during the exam. I'm going to be walking around, like, helping people out if somebody needs assistance or something. I guarantee you I'll, I'll probably need to be, like, helping out people with stuff, answering questions, little questions they have the whole time probably. So I've sort of allocated that time for that too. Okay, so uh, is there any other questions about the exam before we get started? All right, I strongly recommend paying attention to today's class. This is, we've got a lot of material to cover. This is very interesting material. It's going to culminate in Maxwell's equations, which is like the one of the most uh, amazing, amazing moments. I want to I have a little, uh, st and I want to make a comment about talking. So I get it. When I, was, when I was a student, sometimes the professor would be going over something and it didn't make sense, and I'd ask my buddy while he was giving the lecture, hey, what, what's he doing there? I get that. Try not to do that because it's distracting if you talk during the lecture. That's why I have three hours of office hours after this class. That's why I do so many hours of office hours because I get it that there's going to be questions. But I don't, I don't want there to be like too much talking because it gets distracting I mean, you can ask somebody, like, a little question, but, like, not continuous talking, like, because it, it's, and that's also the value of, like, the discussion sections, because during the discussion sections, they're smaller, so, and there's, and it's not material, like, it's, he has, like, the luxury of, like, answering specific questions, but with lecture, we really have to, like, cover all the material that's, that's there, like, it's very important that we don't, um, you know, that we don't, miss up this material. It has to be covered and there, I can't be distracted. And it's for everybody else too. Okay, now we're ready to go. So we're going to get started. There's going to be a lot of different stuff that we talk about today. So it's very important. Okay, so we're going to talk about Lenz's Law. Lenz's Law is sort of a follow-up to Faraday's Law. It explains why we have the situation that we do with Faraday's Law of Induction. And 
it's basically it can be derived from Faraday's law and it always gives the same results sorry this thing is taking just like a second it's very slow um, and the sign rules were that are introduced with Faraday's law um, are there for Lenz's law either but it's often easier to understand and see and we get an intuitive understanding for the induction effects and the role of energy conservation and it's very important like everything that we've learned so far with Faraday's law we just sort of been told it but we don't really understand it intuitively and to really understand electrodynamics we have to understand what's going on physically that's very important so the cause of this can be a changing flux through a stationary circuit due to a varying magnetic field um, and the changing flux due to the motion of the conductors that make up the circuit can also do that or any combination and if the flux in a stationary circuit changes as in the examples that we did earlier the induced current sets up a magnetic field of its own so this this process itself the cu current that we induce from the magnetic field based off of what we learned in the earlier chapters it creates a magnetic field of itself so that's interesting it's sort of a runaway process you've got this changing B field that creates a current and the current creates another magnetic field in response to that like we learned in the last chapter with the right hand rule um, and then within the area bounded by the circuit this field is opposite to the original field if the original field is increasing but it's in the same direction as the original field if the latter is decreasing so that kind of answers it's that starts to answer people's questions from last class what what is actually being opposed what's actually going it's right there within the area of the circuit there's a field a magnetic field that's induced by the current that's been induced by the changing magnetic field and that magnetic field tends to want to balance out so so in other words let's say I have some let's say I have some EMF going on here right don't worry about the direction of the current just say that we have some changing B field going through this surface so we've got a changing B field that B field is going to generate a current and going in some direction let's say it generates a current in just some random direction okay depending upon the direction that the current is going in I can tell which whether this B field is increasing or decreasing because depending upon whether it's if it's increasing then there's going to be a B field induced by this that's going to be wanting to oppose it and we can figure out which direction the current is going to produce a current that's opposing it if it's if it's increasing like going in the current's going to be going this way because there's going to be a B field that wants to oppose it, right? It says it right there in the definition of Lenz's law. Or if it's, if it's decreasing and weakening, there's going to be going in the same direction because it's going to be wanting to balance out that decrease in magnetic field. And what if, this be, what if this magnetic field, though, is no longer increasing or decreasing? What happens to this? Zero we no longer have uh, a current flowing and we no longer have a B field generated this process only happens as long as there's a changing flux through the circuit okay so again within the area bounded by the circuit this field is opposite to the original field if the original field is increasing but in the same direction as the original field if it is decreasing if the flux change is due to motion of the conductors then the direction of the induced current in the moving conductor is such that the direction of the magnetic field force on the conductor is opposite in direction to its motion thus the motion of the conductor which caused the induced current is opposed so the we have a sort of inertia law here and it's almost like an equal and opposite rule like Newton's law sort of where we have forces in pairs I mean not quite though because we're not necessarily talking about um, a change in force we're talking about a change in a B field so be careful with that but just remember that we have this rule here where we have that the motion of the conductor which causes the induced current is opposed 
So we see that with the slide wire generator. Remember, we had this generator where we had this, this is a conductor, right? This conductor has motion to it. This conductor has electrons flowing through it, so it's a conductor and it completes a circuit. The motion of the conductor which caused the induced current is opposed. So there's an opposition to this changing B field produced by this moving object. This mechanical object has a field responding to it. That's pretty cool. That's pretty crazy, okay? That's like some Star Wars stuff right there. We've got this, we've got a physical object moving and there's a field responding to it. That's important. Don't forget that. That's a very like profound thing if you think about it for a second. Okay. So, in these cases, the induced current tries to preserve the status quo by opposing motion or a change in flux. So, how does it oppose, if it's going in the same direction though, what is it opposing? It's opposing the decrease. Because if, if the tendency of the B field is decreasing, it wants to like bring that B field back to some unity or something. It's an interesting like idea. So Lenz's law is also directly related to energy conservation. There we go. So now we have another insight into why we have Faraday's law. It's energy conservation. How? If the induced current were in the opposite direction to that given by Lenz's law, the magnetic force on the rod would accelerate it to ever increasing speed with no external energy source, even though electrical energy is being dissipated in the circuit. And this would be a clear violation of energy conservation and doesn't happen in nature. So what would happen is this thing would just keep going. It would just, it would just be like a runaway process where it would just keep accelerating. So forget about friction for this system. What's slowing this thing down is Lenz's law, energy conservation. That's what's opposing our hand. If we actually take our hand and we move it on this slide wire generator and generate the B field, we could actually feel the response of this field responding to us. We would feel that as a force of opposition if we're increasing the B field. It's opposing our, it's opposing our motion. And if we're going the other way, it's going to be opposing it that way too. Because if we're going the other way, then we're making it decrease, and it's going to be going in that same direction, but that's opposite to our direction, so it's going to be opposing us. So let's show that explicitly with this example. The induced current for the slide wire generator causes an additional magnetic field in the area bounded by the loop. The direction of the induced current is counterclockwise. So we're going to be going counterclockwise this direction. Okay? counterclockwise so from the discussion before whoops from the discussion before the additional magnetic field is directed out of the plane of the figure so there's there's a magnetic field that's directed into the plane of the figure for the slide wire generator the direction is out of the plane for the opposing field and um, it tends to cancel the effect of the field, which is what Lenz's law predicts. So the change in the magnetic flux through a circuit induces a current that produces an additional magnetic field of its own. The induced field always opposes the change. Now, there, let's say we have a uniform magnetic B field through a coil. The magnitude of the field is increasing. So there's an induced EMF. Let's use Lenz's law to determine the direction of the resulting induced current. Get out a sheet of paper and draw this out and try to think about this for just a second. Go ahead, I'll wait for you. Give you like 20 seconds. Or on your tablet is great too. Okay, so think about this. We've got this uniform B field through a coil. It's increasing. Here we go. Here's a picture of it. Let's draw this out. Okay, now get some chalk here. Get some colorful chalk. Let's draw this. So we've got a current going this way. Current is in green, I. We've got a change in the B field going in some other direction. So let's see. 
I'm going to use all different colors so we can see this really clearly. Okay, so we've got B field going up. B, and it's increasing. So it's increasing. It's increasing in strength. So it's a, it's a change in flux. So we will have an induced current. The current is flowing this way, going around. So with the right hand rule pointing in the direction of the current, we've got an induced field going downwards. Right? We learned that from the last chapter. So B induced. B induced is downwards. And then our EMF is in the same direction as our current. Just like a battery, if we're using the positive convention. So the induced current due to the change in B is clockwise, as seen from above the loop. The added field that it causes is downward, opposing the change in the upward field. So we've got this B field downward that's opposing this increasing upward field. Okay, this situation is the same as in example 29.1. By Lenz's law, the induced current must produce a magnetic field inside the coil that is downward, opposing the change in flux, from the right hand rule, we saw that. Okay, so there we go. Now, here's several applications of Lenz's law to a similar situation of a magnet. So now we have a different situation. We have a magnet moving near a conducting loop. So I could just erase this here and change my situation around a little bit. So now we don't have some constant B field. We have a magnet moving around. Okay, we've got the north pole of the magnet right here. North and the lines are going to go through this all the way around back to the south. Okay, so there's my magnetic field lines there. Don't want to draw too many of them, so it's hard to see the... This is the loop, the original loop here. Okay. So, if the, the motion of the magnet causes an increasing downward flux through the loop. Increasing downward flux. Which way is the opposing B field going to go? Upwards. So we know right away, b based off of that, we know the direction that the current's got to go in. So it's going to be going like around like this because we're going to have an induced, we have an increasing downward, we're going to have an upward B induced. B induced is upward in that case. What about the second situation? Motion of the magnet causes a decreasing upward flux. If it's a decreasing upward flux, so it's, it's upwards, but it's decreasing. How is that the case? Because this changes to south, and then I'm moving this magnet away, so the, the field lines are getting fainter because they're falling off with distance. As the field lines, so this, this magnet is moving upwards now. It was moving downwards before. I take my magnet, move it away from the loop, it's a decreasing B field. And then what happens to the direction of the current? Well, it stays in the same direction because it wants to oppose that decrease in the, in the B field. So that decrease in the B field causes it to induce a current in the same direction as before. But it's, it's you're like, is it opposing it though? It is opposing it. It's not opposing the B field. It's opposing the derivative of the B field. Never forget that. That's important. We're talking about a derivative. It's a field. It's a one field responding to not another field, but a derivative of a field. The time rate of change of the field is negative. So the current has to be such that the B field is increasing in that direction to compensate for it. Now, what if we have... Um, a situation like this. So we've got motion of a magnet causes decreasing downward flux through the loop. So we've got a decreasing... Now we reverse the situation and we make it a north again. So we make it a north, a north magnet. Okay. So motion of the magnet causes a decreasing downward flux. Still going upwards, 
And you're, you're, look at this picture a little bit because it's a little more confusing than you think. It sounds easy when I'm talking about it here, but visualize these magnetic field lines and how this actually corresponds to an increasing or decreasing flux. Because this is a little bit interesting. So we've got a north magnetic field going up through, going down through the loop, but it's pulling away again. So it's still a decre it's a decreasing downward flux this time, not a decreasing upward flux. So what is what does that do? That induces a current in the opposite direction. Now we've got a current going this way. Why? Because if it's a decreasing downwards flux, we need it downward to oppose that. So if the current's going this way, B is down to oppose this decrease in down. Um, so let's see here. So to so summarize, if something's becoming if something's downward, but it's becoming less downward, then we define it as positive, right? That's, the, that's like the definition of a derivative. If it's negative, but becoming less negative, it's a positive derivative. Think of it like that, and then it won't be so confusing. Finally, we've got this final situation where we've got um, an increasing upward flux. So we know that it's gotta be downward to oppose that increasing upward flux. Because the north, it's a south magnet now, but it's getting closer. So it's being brought to it. It's south and it's getting closer. So the, the flux, the B fields are going around like this in the magnet. It's getting closer. So there's more and more B fields that are making it through the area of that surface. And remember, this is a geometry problem. We've got an area here to be concerned with. The area of that loop matters a lot. If I take this B, this magnet, and I take it far away from that area, there's going to be just a little bit of flux through that area because the B field falls off in intensity with distance. Those field lines have a lot more places to go. If the magnet is right up next to it, there's not anywhere else for those B field lines to go. The flux is going to be huge. So that's the way to visualize that. Okay. Whenever there's a changing magnetic flux through a circuit, you can use Lenz's law to decide what the induced current direction will be. The current must produce an induced magnetic field. So... Since an induced current always opposes any change in magnetic flux through a circuit, how is it possible for the flux to change at all? And the answer is that Lenz's law gives only the direction of an induced current. The magnitude of the current depends on the resistance of the circuit. So now we're, we're going beyond just magnetism here when we talk about the circuit itself. The, the resistance of the wires and anything that's connected to the circuit comes into consideration when we talk about what current we actually see. So obviously, when we take magnets and we move them around, we're gonna have a lot more of a current going if we have an object that's like a conductor. So now you can see why magnets are so dangerous for like cell phones and stuff. Like when I had these magnets down here, we were warning people, oh, don't get the, the, the cell phone too close to this magnet. Now you can see why, it's because of Lenz's law. Because the, the magnetic field is going to induce a current in your phone that's going to break it because, because that's exactly how this whole process works. So circuits and things that are wired to support a current that are great conductors, they're going to be very responsive to a B field. Okay. So, and if there's zero resistance in the circuit, then the induced current will continue to flow even after the induced EMF has disappeared. And so that's even after the magnet has stopped moving relative to the loop. This is due to persistent current, and it turns out that the flux through the loop is exactly the same as it was before the magnet started to move. So the, the flux through a loop of zero resistance never changes. Um, superconductors have zero resistance. This is kind of an interesting topic. We're not going to talk about that in this class. It's actually an optional section that we're skipping because of time. But this is important in research. Electronics is devoting a significant amount of time to developing high temperature superconductors because it takes a lot of energy to support this superconducting current where the current just continues to flow. It takes a lot of effort to do that. So you have to use a lot of energy in cooling. The, if you get a material that can support it, the same superconducting property, but at a higher temperature, then that's less energy loss for the same gain. So it's definitely of major interest in industry to find these materials that 
support these exotic materials that support this superconducting current. And the higher temperature that it supports, the better. All right, so now we're gonna talk about motional EMF. This is a little bit pretty much related to what we're just talking about. So we've seen several situations in which a conductor moves in a magnetic field. As in the generators that we talked about uh, last class, we talked about how a generator works. We can gain additional insight into the origin of the induced EMF in these situations by considering the magnetic forces on mobile charges in the conductor. Okay, this is great review for your exam that you're about to take on magnetic forces. We're gonna use the magnetic forces to figure out what's going on physically here. So, how does that work exactly? Well, we're gonna have this moving rod separated by a U-shaped conductor. And the magnetic field is uniform and directed into the page. So here's a picture of this rod. I didn't want to have too many words on this, but I'm going to jump back and forth between these two slides. Okay. Actually, let me just do this. I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to post this on here too so you can see it while I'm, while I'm actually talking about it. And then I'll draw this on the board too so that we're super clear about what we're doing here. Okay. So... We've got a moving rod that's a conductor. I'm gonna draw this out really quick. You can draw a picture of it as well if you want, follow along. So we've got, um, we've got our positive and our negative here. And then we've got our B field into the page. Okay, this is B field into the page. And then we've got some velocity vector here. It's moving with some velocity. So it's gonna be a changing flux. So and then we've got charges. They're going from positive up here at point A down to negative. And so what it says is charges in the moving rod are acted upon by a magnetic force, Fb. And then the resulting charge separation creates a canceling electric force. So we're not talking about just magnetic forces anymore. Remember, we talked about how the magnetic force doesn't do any work because it always acts perpendicular. So now we're talking about what's going on in a circuit where we actually have an electric force coming about in this process. So things just got a little bit more complicated, right? So we've got this B field is uniform and directed into the page. We move the rod this way to the right um, at a constant velocity. A charged particle in the rod then experiences a force. The force is QV cross B. So, and the magnitude is QVB. So if, this, if we make this like the I-hat direction, then we're gonna have, the force is gonna be QV I-hat cross into the page minus K-hat, right? Everybody agree with me about that? Any questions? Good? Okay. So we can figure out the direction of the force by taking that cross product, which let's just do that here. Okay? So we've got QV cross K. Okay? What direction is that going to be in? It's going to be... It's going to be in the J hat direction. K hat's going to be zero as well. So it's going to be minus... 1 times minus 1 minus 0 times 0. I just wrote that out because you're going to be seeing that on your exam. So, so it's going to be in the J hat direction, minus minus. So we know that the force is going to be in the J hat direction. So the force is going to be like this, right? Force. There's going to be some force there. Um, and then we'll assume that Q is positive, and in that case, the direction of the force is upward along the rod, just like we figured out. We just did that. So now we've proven why, when they say it's upward along the rod, we know why, right there. Okay, we'll assume that Q is positive. Yeah, yeah, we just said that. Okay, and then the direction of the force is going from B toward A. Okay, there's another picture of that. So the motional EMF in the moving rod creates an electric field in the stationary conductor. So there's an electric field 
that's actually the origin of the EMF. Yes. No, we found the force we found the force on the charges is in the J hat direction. It's in J hat upward. Yes. We found that from from Q V cross B right there. So what what sorry, what was that question? Um because so let's see. So let's talk about this. So to answer your question, um there's a charge separation going on because of the fact that we have this um, induced field going on that's creating an EMF. So there's a motion due to the EMF, right? Remember, the B field produces a current. So the charges, what they mean by the charges are moving, the charges start moving when we start moving the rod because there's an induced current and that's what's causing these charges to move. It's not the magnetic force great good question so he's like wait a second what's the what's the origin of this current it's not the magnetic force it's the induced emf given by faraday's law that's what's charge, causing the charge separation but what happens is when you take charges and you separate them you create an electric field just like a battery right like if i take a battery what is a battery a battery in its essence is separated charges the fact what makes a battery work is I have a bunch of negative charges on one hand and positive charges on the other. The charges are separated, and that's what creates this voltage source. So this is an electric field, essentially, and a, also a voltage source that happens because things are moving. So the magnetic force causes the free charges in the rod to move. And they say it's the magnetic force, but actually that's not precise. We know it's Faraday's law, really. The changing magnetic flux. And it creates an axis of positive charge at the upper end and negative charge at the lower end. This, in turn, creates an electric field E within the rod in the direction from A towards B. So now we've got an electric field, but it's not going in the same direction. It's going this way. The electric field is going like that opposite to the magnetic force okay pay attention to that that's important there's a there's an electric field but it's opposite to the magnetic force the charge continues to accumulate at the end of the rod until e becomes large enough for the downward electric force with magnitude qe so this this force has magnitude qe and that's going to cancel the qvb we're going to have a cancellation so we could even draw like a free body diagram of the charges on this thing, right? We're going to have a QVB and a, this is positive, and we're going to have a minus QE, where we have the force on the charge given by the charge itself times the electric field from Coulomb's law, basically. So, yeah, so we've got the, um, and then the charges are in equilibrium. So QE equals QVB. And then that's kind of an interesting little equation here because we could cancel out the Q and we, then we have a ratio for how the electric and magnetic fields depend upon the velocity, right? Because if we have, we have QVB equals QE, this is the B field, this is the E field. Well, these Qs just cancel. So then I have that the ratio of how much E field I have to how much B field I have depends upon the velocity, which they didn't even show there. They didn't even talk about this in this particular example. But that's very interesting from a, from a perspective of a physicist. Because if I'm a physicist and I want to study these fields, I'm like, wait a second, these things are actually like related by some velocity. There's some velocity connecting these two fields. This is exactly the kind of thing that got scientists like Maxwell and Einstein and those figuring out this point. So this, this little tidbit, this little factoid about Faraday's law and Lenz's law, it sounds kind of inconsequential. It's like, that's kind of cool. That's actually like the, the starting point of like modern physics, excluding like quantum mechanics. Because like once you realize that, oh, this B field induces an E field and the two are related by some velocity, 
Then you start thinking about the speed. You start, somebody started thinking about, hey, what about if E, B, and B fields keep inducing each other and then they travel with some velocity? And then that was like Maxwell's realization about the speed of light and E and B fields being made up of light. Yes? Um, it's because of, it's, 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 it's not something that we observe. It's something that we know happens because we have, we have some charge separation. And we know that since the charge is accumulating in this direction, that the electric field has to be going in the opposite direction because of the charge accumulation. It's, it's, it comes about from our understanding of, electro, of electrodynamics. So in other words, when we have a, when we have a positive E field, right? For the E field is not just necessarily going downwards. It might be going in every direction. But for this specific case, the charges are accumulating here. So the E field is getting bigger and it's opposing this direction of the B field. So, and it's because of the fact that there's a current flowing and the current is accumulating here. So the E field is getting bigger. Just like if I take some currents here and I have like positive, I have like positive and negative, right? and they're all here, this is neutral. But then if I take these charges and separate them, I have like positive, positive, negative, and then a negative here, that field is gonna be bigger. And then if I take this other negative charge and bring it over and I have two negative charges, then I have like the biggest E field. This is bigger, this E field is bigger than like this one, E zero, bigger than E zero. So it has to do with the charge separation causing the field to get bigger. And then the charge continues to accumulate until the, the actual uh, forces are balanced and equal and opposite. And the magnitude of the potential difference, VAB is equal to VA minus V, which is E, right? Potential difference, they're talking about this, EMF. They didn't, they didn't put it there explicitly, but that's important. We actually, we're talking about an EMF here. That's going to be VAB equals E times L equals VBL. Okay? So E, L, and then V, B, L. That's the induced EMF here with a point at higher potential. At point A has higher potential than point B. So this is our positive, this is our positive voltage, okay? Now, why isn't, if there's a positive voltage, why isn't there any current flowing though? They didn't ask that question. Wait a second, shouldn't there be a current flowing? Why isn't there a current flowing? That's a question, can somebody think about that? Why isn't there a current flowing if there's a positive voltage? voltage here positive emf shouldn't there be there would be if it was if it's connected there's positive and negative because the b field is still there and the b field is exerting an upward force so there is a desire for this current to go this way but it can't because it's got this b field exerting forces on it in the opposite direction caused by the situation with the changing b field and also the fact that we have charges moving, we have a QV cross B caused by the magnetic field going into the page. So we have a force causing the magnetic field into the page that's going upwards on the charges. The charges were moving because they had an induced current, but then they stop moving when the E field balances out the magnetic force. So if E fields and B fields can balance each other out, Maybe they're not all that different from each other. Maybe they're sort of one and the same from a different perspective. Okay, so we have this moving rod that's become a source of EMF. Within it, charge moves from lower to higher potential, and in the remainder of the circuit, charge moves from higher to lower potential, and we call this motional EMF. So now we do have it actually moving, and it's, it's caused by this EMF. So when we reach the point where it's sort of got this EMF going, then it does move. And then we have this EMF given by this expression. So it's based basically 
proportional to the velocity because the stronger the, the faster the velocity the stronger this EMF is going to be so if I take a lot of energy and I push it along with a high velocity then I have a lot of current flowing and I have a lot of EMF it depends actually the current depends upon the conductor but basically if the con if the if it's a good conductor and it stays the same then I can actually have the situation be that if I go faster than I did before I'm gonna have more of an EMF and then so here we have the motional EMF which again we had another expression for EMF too that was related to Faraday's law so now we have a way to get EMF that's independent of a changing flux what was our source of EMF we had one from e from electrostatics it was a battery that was our only source of EMF a voltage source then we had a changing B field a changing flux of B field through an area that could give us an EMF now we have another source this is the third source of EMF that we've now discovered V B L and L is the conductor length so conductor length that affects the EMF makes it bigger B is the uniform B field that we talked about that was going into the page so B field that exerts a force on charges to begin with and then V is the velocity of the object velocity of conductor so that's our motional EMF so this corresponds to a force per unit charge of magnitude VB that's the force per unit charge acting for a distance L along the moving rod and if the total circuit resistance of the u-shaped conductor in the sliding rod is R the induced current I in the circuit is given by VBL equals IR because remember V E equals V equals IR for a circuit so now I have a, a way to relate the EMF to VBL here for our emotional EMF case VBL so then we can have V B L equals I R. And then this is the same result that we actually found in 29.2 using Faraday's law. So the same content that's in Faraday's law is in this motional EMF, but it's a different way to arrive at it. But you don't necessarily have to have a changing B field flux here we could actually have a constant B field but I actually I'm gonna I'm gonna for now I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave that off because I don't want to overcomplicate things this one still has a changing B field because we have the velocity going changing the uh, current changing the area through it but in general there might be ways that we'll see later where you can actually have um, emotional EMF without like an explicit like change in the area but there's always some sort of a change in the B field that's going to induce this EMF that gets this process started and it induces an electric field so actually the big takeaway from all of this is not the fact that we created another source of EMF the takeaway is this that our B field our changing B field induced an electric field so changing B fields induce electric fields that's the biggest takeaway from all of this and comes back to this interesting way to relate B and E fields that they're related by the ratio of this and that's the velocity relates so as the velocity increases the percentage of the field energy that's B field increases with increasing velocity if it's going slow the B field is 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 not is is going to be small or it's going to be it's going to be different it changes in relation to the velocity i should say depending upon what the velocity is okay so it is a case of faraday's law and we can verify the velocity in meters per second so
the EMF associated with this moving rod is analogous to that of a battery with its positive terminal at A and its negative terminal at B. Although the origins of the two EMFs are quite different, in each case a non-electrostatic force acts on the charges in the device in the direction from B to A. And the EMF is the work per unit charge done by this force when a charge moves from B to A in the device. So, when the device is connected to an external circuit, the direction of the current is from B to A in the device and from A to B in the external circuit. Note that the motional EMF is also present in the isolated moving rod in the same way that a battery has an EMF even when it's not part of a circuit. So there we go. Now we have a sort of like an answer about whether or not, even if it's just a moving rod by itself, and it does have uh, emotional EMF present, even if it doesn't have a way for the charges to flow through some, some sort of wire or something. Uh, you can determine the direction of the induced EMF using Lenz's law. So if it's a, if it's a changing B field, um, even if the conductor does not form a complete circuit. So any time that you have this situation, you don't even have to have a, an, a complete circuit to have a potential for an induced EMF. Because a potential is just that. It's a potential. It doesn't act until you have a complete circuit to cause the current to have a way to actually respond and flow. Um, so we can complete a circuit between the ends of a conductor and use Lenz's law to determine the direction of the current by just imagining that it was connected to some wires if it's not already. And from this we can deduce the polarity. Polarity just means which sign it is, positive, negative, of the ends of the open circuit conductor. So the direction from the negative to the positive end within the conductor is the direction the current would have if the circuit were complete. So there's another picture of it here. So we've got this conducting loop that moves in a magnetic field. This element of the loop has length dl and velocity v. You ca we calculate the motional EMF due to this element. DE is v cross b dot dl. Then we repeat for each element in the loop. And the total motional EMF in the loop is the integral from all the contributions from all of the elements. So we have a sort of line integral here. It's a line integral along this curved path. Remember I talked about the difference between um, a normal integral and a line integral and how it, it's actually, it's very similar in some ways, but it's completely different in others. So just to, remem just to remind you, I can integrate some function with respect to like a, an, a dx, and then I have an integral of f of x dx, where this is my f of x. And then you hear, you're taught that this is the area under the curve, and that's true, but really a better way to think about it, a more sophisticated way to think about it is, it's the value of the function with respect to dx. So I'm saying, this is my value of my function here, and then I'm counting up all the value of my function with respect to dx here. And then that does give me an area under the curve. But it's better to think about it as terms of this is the value of my function with respect to this. Because what if I do something like this? What if I say, what's f dy? Is that a valid point? Yes, it is. But then it's the value of my function with respect to the y-axis. Okay? If, there, if this function is now a function of y. So, but almost always it's just f of x if it's normal calculus. But in here, now we're not doing, we're doing 3D calculus. Now we're saying dl, what's dl? My dl becomes, actually I should do it the reverse. My dx becomes my dl. And so now this is what we're counting up the value of the function along. We're saying how is my function related? Let's say I have some function f of x that's in 3D. I'm counting up the value of the function all along this path. And that's the meaning of that, that circle, funny circle integral. That's a different way to see it. So what we're doing here then is we're counting up. We have the total emotional EMF in the loop is the integral of the contributions from all the elements. This V cross B dot 
DL. And the dot product is what puts us, what projects onto this DL. That's what makes this count up along here because we're counting up all the components that are parallel to wherever this infinitesimal DL is. So this little infinitesimal bit here is a little bit of V cross B. It's a little bit of V cross B that's dotted with DL, meaning that it's perpendicular, parallel to it. Not perpendicular, parallel. It's not the cross product, it's the dot product. So it's the part that they share a component. And then I just count this up for the whole remainder of this. So then my induced EMF then for this motional case is given by this integral V cross B and then it's dotted with DL. Okay. So calculating the motional EMF for a uh, moving current loop, the velocity can be different for different elements of the loop. And it's rotating and changing in shape. The magnetic field B can have different values at different points around the loop. B can be, B doesn't have to be constant. This is so general. This could change for different points along the loop. And for any closed conducting loop, the total EMF is the total integral. Okay. Let's take a little break. Um, we're going to do like a short 10 minute break and then we're going to come back and try to finish this up and get to the grand finale for this chapter. Come back shortly and I'll, we'll finish. All right, so we've got our expression here for our motional EMF with the integral, the line integral. And this looks very different than our original statement of Faraday's law of minus dB by dt. In fact, the two statements are actually equivalent. One is the integral version and one is the differential aver version. So let's see how they're equivalent. So how is, how does this, I'm going to erase this here. How does this integral of V cross B dotted with the DL here, let me show you, yeah, dotted with DL, okay, how does that equal to Faraday's law? It's equal to minus d phi b phi dt. Well, <clears throat> it can be shown that the rate of change of magnetic flux through a moving conducting loop is always given by the negative of the expression. Thus, this equation gives us an alternative formulation of Faraday's law that is often convenient in problems with moving conductors. But when we have stationary conductors, in changing magnetic fields, uh, 29.7 cannot be used. In this case, E equals minus d phi b by dt is the only correct way to express Faraday's law. So this, this expression only works for um, moving conductors, but it's probably better to use than Faraday's law for the moving conductor case. If it's stationary, there's nothing going on with the object other than the B field is changing, then we need Faraday's law. So this is not a, an equation that is as general as F equals MA. It, it has to have some kind of velocity going on for it to be appli applicable. All right, let's do an example. We have a moving rod that's 10 meter, 0 0.10 meters long. The velocity is 2.5 meters per second. Okay, so we've got this We've got the length, that's going to be useful. It's 10 centimeters long, and it's got a velocity of 2.5 meters. And the total resistance of the loop R is 0 0.03 ohms, and B is 0 0.6 teslas. Find the motional EMF, the induced current, and the force acting on the rod. So we find the motional EMF from our equation that we just had, right? Let's go back and see that here. We've got our equation VBL. That's the EMF, VBL. 
So EMF is VBL 0.5 volts, 0.15 volts. The induced current in the loop then is, since V is equal to IR, they use the E term here instead of V, but it's, that's where that comes from. Then we have the voltage over the resistance that gives us the current of 5 amperes. Okay, now what about the magnetic force? L points in the same direction as the induced current in the rod from B to A. So the right hand rule for the vector product shows that this force is directed opposite to the rod's motion. Since L and B are perpendicular, the force has magnitude ILB, which we remember from the last chapter. So we have, we found I, so then, so you have, you realize if, if I want, if you want to know the force, first you have to actually find out what I is, which we solve for, and then we know what L and B are, so then we have a force of 0.3 newtons. Um, and we can check this answer for F by using Lenz's law. If we take an area vector and point it into the plane of the loop, the magnetic flux is positive and increasing as the rod moves to the right. So it's still this, it's still this area thing. We've got a B field going into the page, and it's the area is increasing as this rod goes this way. It increases the area of the loop. Lenz's law tells us that a force appears to oppose this increase in flux, so the force is on the rod is to the left, opposite its motion. So there's a force this way to cancel it. And that's the force. Remember I was talking about this law tells you how a human person can interact with a field directly. You're interacting with a force field when you do something like this. You could feel this force. We got to do a demo of this. We're going to do some really cool demos after this, this midterm exam. I'm going to do one with this. I'm going to do one with the um, displacement current too. So um, we've also got a Faraday disk dynamo which is a conducting disk with radius R. Um, and it lies in the XY plane and it rotates with a constant angular velocity about the Z axis. The disk is in a uniform constant B field in the Z direction. So what about if we have a rotation? Let's find the induced EMF between the center and the rim of the disk. So here we've got this interesting sort of device. Faraday disk dynamo. And it's, it actually has a rotation going on, which is a form of an acceleration. Well, not necessarily. It's a, yeah, it is an acceleration, an angular acceleration, even if it's rotating at constant uh, velocity, there's some kind of acceleration. But it could also be changing how fast it's rotating, and then that's another form of acceleration. So there's this direction omega. That, that indicates the direction that the rotation is occurring in. So omega is an angular frequency, an angular velocity in like radians per second, how fast it's going. And then we've got the disk that actually goes through it like this, and it's rotating along this axis through the center. Okay. And then what about my, and I'll erase this so it's a little bit easier to see. So it ends here and goes out this way. Okay, great. The B field's going this way. All right, B field here. And then we've got this, we want to figure out what's the, what's the potential here along this little path here from like zero to R, and we have a little dr element. We have a changing, uh, we have a changing voltage? What's this all about? Let's see what's going on here. We've got the speed of the disk uh, is different all along this, this disk. V is equal to omega R. So the velocity is highest here and lowest here. That is true for the Earth as well. When you're at the equator, you're going much faster than you are at the North Pole because you're rotating the same amount of angle, but you're covering much larger distance because you're tracing out a larger path in the same amount of time than you are somewhere on this inner region. So there's a different velocity. And the EMF induced across the segment from this little DR segment is going to be, uh, and we're going to hook this up to some, we're going to connect this circuit and connect it to some current and resistor, and then we're going to bring it back up to here. So we have some current flowing from, from B. 
and then the current flows along here like this, I. It's a lot going on here, so we'll, we'll take a little bit of time on this. The, in, the EMF induced across this segment is VBDR. That's DL, right? VB, VBDL, but now we have DRs as in our case of L. So we have a little bit of differential uh, EMF. V is constant, B is constant. Our differential is DR drawn here. So then the induced segment, but then we have that V is equal to something, omega R. So we have omega R, B, DR. And then we can figure out what this is. So the vector length DL or length DR is associated with a segment that points radially outward. So here's my DR. It's a segment that points radially outward in the same direction as V cross B. And my B field's going this way. And V is changing. So, but, but V is is everywhere tangent. Remember, tangential velocity. So V and B are perpendicular. So I've got like, if it's rotating, I might have my V vector going in some direction and it's perpendicular here. So I've got V perpendicular. And the magnitude of V is omega R. The EMF from this segment is then DE is equal to omega R B DR, given here. Okay, the total EMF is the integral of DE from the center, R is equal to zero, to the rim, R is equal to R. So now we have this nice little way to visualize this line integral. And I, they, turned it from a, they turned it from a line integral to just a normal integral. Um, because even though we are, even though we're going from we're not looking at the, the path along here because that's constant. The EMF change goes from the center outward along the radial distance. So this, this line integral reduces to a normal integral from zero to R in this case because of the geometry of this particular problem. So sometimes we can have it that our line integral reduces to a normal integral. So that's one of the things that could make these kinds of problems very difficult. If I just covered this and I just put this problem on an exam without going over it, I think that would be like pretty hard. You'd be like, what a second, how do I do this again? Like, what's the EMF? Where do I start? So this is like good to go over this explanation because it's important for solving these problems to understand what's really going on. So the total EMF is given by this integral from zero to R, and then we've got our omega R B dr and then we just take that integral and it's like this is the easiest integral in the world i wouldn't even have to give you that integral i don't think that's just a polynomial right it's just one it's just like the integral of like x dx right so we have one half omega b r squared but maybe i would still give you the integral on it i might put it on there like okay what's the integral of polynomial power you know you take that rule okay so then we can use this device as a source of EMF in a circuit by completing the circuit through two stationary brushes labeled B that contact the disk and its conducting shaft. And it's called the Faraday disk dynamo or a homopolar generator. Unlike the alternator in uh, the example that we did last class, this Faraday disk dynamo is a direct current generator. It produces an EMF that is constant in time. So the EMF, once this thing gets spinning, as long as we have rotation, we have an EMF. You can bet that these things are actually used in, in devices. These are useful. The Faraday disk dynamos, uh, Tesla. Tesla absolutely used these. The, the Tesla, the inventor, he definitely used these all the time in his inventions. Very important. Um, and he was a big fan of Faraday, by the way. Okay, so uh, you can use Lenz's law to show for the direction of rotation the current in the external circuit. And I gotta kinda speed up a little bit, but basically you can see that it's, um, it's constant in time. 
Whoops, why did I do that again? Okay. So, when a conductor moves in a magnetic field, we can understand the induced EMF on the basis of magnetic forces on charges in the conductor, but an induced EMF also occurs when there's a changing flux through a stationary conductor. What is it that pushes the charges around the circuit in this type of situation? So, what, how do we get the, what's pushing the, the charges around in the stationary situation? Let's consider the situation shown in this figure here. We've got a long, thin solenoid with cross-sectional area A and N turns per unit length. Oops, let me go back a little bit. Okay, let's, let's show this. Let me actually draw this out because this is important. We're going to, we're going to see, we're going to make the connection for how these different things are connected. How we have uh, B fields connected to E fields and how we have an EMF for a stationary source where it has just has a changing B field. So we've got this solenoid, we've got this area of this cylinder here going along like this, okay? The solenoid wraps around, we'll use green here. Okay, we've got our solenoid going around like this. And we've got a galvometer, which you might see in your lab. Hopefully you do see it in your lab. This cool galvometer. Okay. Um, and this is a wire loop. Actually, the galvometer is here. Sorry. Wire loop is here. Put a G for galvometer. And then we've got a B field going this way. Why did I draw it like that? What am I thinking? Should be across. Like that. Okay. Um, and then we've got the current. Let's show that current then. So the current flows along this solenoid, but it goes this way. The current has this, and then it has a di by dt. There's a change in current in time as well. And then the current flows along this wire loop like this as well. Okay. And then the this is a region that has a magnetic field and it's not pictured. So the windings of the long solenoid carry a current that is increasing. So this is increasing here. So let's label this. Current is increasing. The derivative is greater than zero for di by dt. We've got increasing current. Uh, the magnetic flux in the solenoid is increasing. So there's a B field going this way through the solenoid, through the windings of the solenoid, and it's increasing. dB by dt is also positive. And this changing flux passes through the wire loop here. This wire loop, there's a changing flux through the solenoid, but there's also a wire loop through the solenoid. And the EMF is minus d phi b by dt that's induced in the loop. So the loop has an induced EMF minus d phi b by dt. That's the induced EMF in the loop here. It's going through the loop, there's an induced EMF because there's a magnetic flux. It's going through there. Um, and the current, if there's an induced current, so let's call this I prime. I prime. It's not the same as this I. These, these two wires are not in contact with each other. This, these, the, the current going through this these windings of this solenoid is not in contact with this current. Not in contact. Um, and then the galvometer measures I prime. And then we also have a cross-sectional view of this situation. So we got, now we're just looking at the loop. So the cross-sectional view there is of the loop. So we've got our loop. Cross-sectional view. We've got our galvometer on top here. We've got our B field, it's into the page from the cross-sectional view, and we've got an E field. Look, we're, we're making an E field here. 
we're going to start to see how what drives this current around, and it's surely this E field going like this. There's an E field. But where does that come from? It's got to have something to do with this B field here because we've got current going in the, and then we've got current going in the opposite direction. So be careful with this view because this cross-sectional view is tilted kind of weird, and the current in this view, the current is actually going like around this way. I prime is going this way. Should be I prime, not I. The windings of the long solenoid carry a current I that is increasing at a rate di by dt. The magnetic flux in the solenoid is increasing as a, at a rate d phi b by dt. And this changing flux passes through a wire loop. An EMF is induced in the loop, inducing a current I that is used to measure the galvanometer. Now they didn't, they kind of just expected you to figure this out. But remember that it's not enough to have a B field going through this. We have to have a changing B field. So a current, a current does not produce a changing B field. Very confusing. Very, very confusing. A current does not produce a changing B field. It's a changing current. DI by DT is changing, and that produces a changing B field. So it's, it's got to, it's, it only has, this process only happens because I is not only going through producing a B field, but it's changing. If I wasn't changing, we would not have an EMF going for this. The situation wouldn't work, but we do. So we have a changing magnetic flux through the loop. The EMF E is minus D phi B by DT, and the current I prime that's measured by the galvanometer is that. So then when the solenoid current I changes with time, the magnetic flux is also changes, and according to Faraday's law, the induced EMF in the loop is given by this expression because we have, on the one hand, Faraday's law, and on the other hand, we have this B field for a solenoid, and then we have the rate of change with respect to current here. So we've got a minus, we've got dB by dt, d phi by dt now, the flux, and that's a negative. But that's equal to minus mu naught, minus mu naught, and turns at number of turns area times di by dt. And this is for the solenoid, the result for the solenoid. So if the total resistance of the loop is R, the induced current in the loop, which we can call, this is the loop here. We're talking about this loop again. We've got I prime, that's gonna be equal to E. I prime is equal to E over R, where E is the induced EMF caused by this changing current going through this solenoid, causing a changing B field. And the induced EMF produces its own B field to oppose this B field, which we haven't really drawn there yet. But what, but what force makes the charges move around the wire loop? It can't be a magnetic force because the loop isn't even in a magnetic field. We are forced to conclude that there has to be an induced electric field in the conductor caused by the changing magnetic flux. So the changing magnetic flux um, causes the, and I would take issue with them saying it isn't in a magnetic field. I mean, a current creates a magnetic field. It's not in a magnetic field in the sense that we don't have a magnet there, but there's a magnetic field because of the current. But anyway, yes, so we've got this changing magnetic flux. It induced electric fields from this process. And these induced electric fields are very different from the electric fields caused by charges, which we talked about way back in last quarter. So to see this, note that when a charge goes once around the loop, the total work done on it by the electric field must be Q times the EMF. QV is the work done. So that's, the, that's in other words, that's the electric field in the loop is not conservative. So this is not a conservative electric field. That's weird um, because the line integral around this path is not zero. 
So indeed, this line integral representing the work done by the induced electric field per unit charge is equal to the induced EMF. So remember that these, these electric fields are sort of different than the electric fields from like a point charge. They're, they're not conservative. So from Faraday's law then, the EMF is also the negative of the rate of change of magnetic flux through the loop. So we can restate Faraday's law in terms of this. It's also the integral around the loop, E dot DL, of the electric field. So, so this is different. We didn't, we're not looking at, an, we're, we're writing Faraday's law, but instead of writing it in terms of a change in flux of magnetic field, or even a line integral of a B field or a force or whatever we did earlier, now we're writing it in terms of the actual electric field. So we have a way to write Faraday's law exactly in terms of not a magnetic field, but an electric field. So then the, for a stationary integration path, the line integral of electric field around a path is equal to the negative of the time rate of change of magnetic flux through the path. So we have some magnetic flux going through this. Let me redraw this here. We've got some magnetic flux going through here. dB by dt. And then that change in dB by dt, the negative of that, it's going to be the integral of E dot dl along this path here, this little bit of dl here. We take the integral along all of this, the electric field, E dotted with that dl, and that gives us the same. So now we have like a spatial relationship. We can see spatially that we have an electric field, and the electric field that falls along this dl is related to this magnetic field that's coming in through the area that's perpendicular to it. And Faraday's law is always true in this form of d phi b by dt. And, but the last equation for the electric field is only valid if the path around which we call it integrated is stationary. Okay, so we are out of time. We're going to have to pick this up. Uh, not next class because we've got the midterm, but the class after that. But that's totally cool. This is very important material. All right, have a great day.